Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining me tonight. I'm so sorry for the delay in logging on. Um, but here we are. I'm so excited to present this topic, um, which is pulsed electric magnetic field therapy for our feathery, scaly, and small mammal patients. I get so excited when the exotics department calls me to work on these species. I am so fortunate to work at the Animal Medical Center where our exotics department is so supportive of the therapies we offer, which is integrative and rehabilitative therapies. One of which is uh, pulsed electric magnetic field therapy, which as you will learn tonight is a really wonderful tool, particularly for our exotic species. What we'll be discussing tonight is uh, the challenges that we have in treating these exotic species and a little bit of background on PMF, um, how long it's been around, and particularly the mode of action, which I think is important in understanding why it can be so effective for a variety of different conditions. And then application specifically in our exotic species. And finally, I'll give you some very practical treatment recommendations. So I hope you'll leave tonight with some really good basic knowledge that you can put into practice immediately to help your exotic species. So these are the patients we're talking about. Um, as you can see in these pictures, all of these uh, precious animals are really severely ill. Um, and that's really uh, the point of a lot of what I'm gonna be presenting tonight is to have a non-invasive device that can help their recovery is really useful for these species. So we're gonna be talking about the small mammals, rabbits, um, turtles and snakes, as well as birds. So, Illness in exotic species uh, present to us really often at the end stage of their disease. They're very good at hiding their illness. And so by the time they show up to our practice, they are often in a very fragile state to the point where just your handling of the patient could result in death. Um, they've sometimes not been eating for days or weeks um, and really, puts us in a situation as practitioners where we could potentially cause more harm in the interventions that we're providing for them because of that fragile state that we're in at presentation. And we're also challenged in exotic species with our choices in pain medications. So, uh, you know, most of the pain medications that are available in veterinary medicine, if they are FDA approved, um, it's usually in uh, canine or feline uh, for small animal medicine. In some cases, um, they've been studied in rabbits, which is really great, but particularly for reptile species, for example, and amphibians, you know, these drugs have rarely ever been studied on these species. So we don't really know the bioavailability. We also have very little knowledge of the safety of these medications and even less information about the efficacy uh, regarding these medications. And also it can be difficult to administer these medications um, in our patients that might be in that very fragile state. So for those of our participants this evening, I am curious to know how many of you are currently using the ACC loop on reptile species. So that be snakes, turtles, or if you're treating other reptiles um, in birds, rabbits or other small mammals, because there's certainly lots of other small mammals that get presented to exotics clinics. So there should be a poll um, that hopefully one of our CC sponsors here can put up for us. Okay, so what I can do, Dr. Alvarez, usually I think the polls, we have to, to program them in ahead of time. So I can definitely take a tally if people want to um, put oh, their answers Julie, in the q and section. Yeah, I gave them to Julie ahead of time. She said that they were all Oh, she up. did? Okay, bear with yeah. me. I'm so sorry. Hold on here. Yes, there is launch polling. There we go. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> Lots of technical difficulties. All right. So if you want to answer on your screen, um, if you're currently using the ACC loop for snakes, turtles, birds, rabbits, or other small mammals. Okay. Give it just a few more seconds.
Okay, can you see that or do you want me to rat, uh, name off the percentage here? Um, sure, I don't know if you can show the results. That would be wonderful. There we go. Wonderful, yeah. Okay, awesome. So most of you are using it on rabbits. That's awesome. And then um, the fewest percentage is for reptiles. So your snakes and turtles, you're not often using the loop for them. And, and quite a few of you are using it on birds and other small mammals. So awesome. I'm so excited that all of you seem to have familiarity um, with using the PMF, which is fantastic. Um, excellent. So yeah, particularly because of what I was just talking about with the challenges in these species, I find the ACC loop to be a really, really wonderful tool among the very many things that we have available to help these exotic species. But I, I think it is a really wonderful tool to help many conditions. And I, we'll talk about tonight some of the conditions that I think are more amenable. Um, you're going to see uh, rapid results with the loop. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit of background because I think a lot of people see this loop and I kind of, you know, kind of put the little side eye like what what is this, how does it work, you know, is this voodoo medicine, what are we talking about. Um, well, it turns out that all atoms and cells in our bodies produce electromagnetic fields and every organ in our body produces a very unique bioelectromagnetic field signal. And in fact, that can even vary between those individual organ systems. And over 70 trillion cells in our body every single day are communicating via these electromagnetic signals. And our bodies and our cells are extremely sensitive to changes in these electromagnetic signals. So this is how our cells are already communicating in our bodies. This is of course, across all species, we have electromagnetic communication for cellular functions every single day. And so it's no surprise with the sensitivity that individual tissues and organ systems have to these electromagnetic fields that if we use a device which taps into this biological electromagnetic field that we could have a very efficacious result. Specifically for the ACC loop, this isn't true for all electromagnetic field devices. And I'll, I'll talk to you this evening about the difference between the devices that are out there. But specifically for the ACC loop, we actually understand the mode of action. And it has to do with the anti inflammatory nitrous oxide cascade. So essentially, what happens is the voltage dependent binding of calcium to calmodulin is upregulated by the PMF device. And when you upregulate, regulate that binding of calcium into calmodulin, you have an increased production of constitutive nitrous oxide synthase, and therefore an increase in nitrous oxide formation, which leads to almost immediate, like within seconds, vasodilation. So if you're treating a patient that has poor blood flow, for example, to an area, like let's say a wound that's not healing well, you can instantly bring more blood flow to the area by uh, using the PMF device over that lesion. And so this calcium calmodulin, nitrous oxide and cyclic GMP bind together and have really an effect of an anti-inflammatory cascade where, whereby we have a decreased in inflammatory cytokines, for example, interleukin-1 beta is gonna drop drastically, um, leading to reduction in inducible nitrous oxide synthase. So, you know, there's, there's two different kinds of nitrous oxide. The good kind, which is an anti-inflammatory effect comes from the constitutive nitrous oxide. And the bad kind, which actually leads to further inflammatory changes is the inducible nitrous oxide. So this voltage dependent binding that the PMF upregulates has an effect to reduce the inducible nitrous oxide synthase, increase production of constitutive nitrous oxide synthase, and that leads to production of anti-inflammatory mediators, including fibroblastic growth factor two, VEGF, and an increase in angiogenesis, which happens over weeks, uh, minutes to weeks. Um, so when you're using this cumulatively, you're gonna have a change in the tissues where you're gonna get better blood flow and anti-inflammatory cytokines in the area. All of this leads to improved tissue regeneration 
and remodeling for these tissues that have been damaged, it helps to improve their tissue healing capacity. So that's how it works, which is pretty cool that we understand very specifically how the device works. Um, and this has been around for centuries. This isn't some in vogue new device. You know, it's not like an iPhone that just came out, you know, in the last few decades. This has been around for over a century. The early devices um, actually caused heat formation. And so in the early 1930s, they took these dia diathermy machines, which had radio frequencies that actually generated heat into the deep tissues, and they were adapted not to generate heat, thereby making them a much safer form of therapy. And these things were huge. They kind of look like you're going into a CT scan and your whole body goes into it. Um, and in the 1980s, these devices were used primarily to improve bone healing. In fact, they were called bone growth stimulators, and they were approved by the FDA from multiple um, studies that were published around that time, demonstrating improvement, particularly in malunion fractures. And in fact, one of these studies was done in beagles. Um, and so that is how we got the FDA approval for this device. And then since then, we've had even further development of the device whereby beginning in the 1990s, um, we made these devices into smaller, more portable devices. So they're battery operated and they provide more targeted therapy, which is in fact even more efficacious than the big dia uh, diathermy machines that were used previously. And these are particularly effective for treating soft tissues, particularly those tissues that have inflammation or edema. So this stuff has been around for a long time. Um, so here we are, our first case. I'm going to be showing you lots of fun cases because I'm very grateful to my exotics team. Um, they flooded me with pictures of all the patients they routinely treat with PMF. Um, this is a case that we collaborated with Dr. Cindy Brown. Um, this is a really sweet duck. Um, uh, named Chip, um, who presented for an open fracture. You can see there in the metatarsals are completely displaced. Um, it was an open fracture and actually became infected. So not only did he have an open fracture, he had osteomyelitis. And so our rehab team collaborated with his treatment. Um, and here you can see him, he's adorable duck. Um, and look at how easy it was to administer this treatment. Literally, we just had him standing and we would put the PMF device um, in the center of his foot. The device is delivering therapy up and down that foot. Um, and then after several weeks, you can see here the after photo where we had complete healing, um, not just of the the skin, but also of the fracture itself. And this was all done non-invasively. So the duck actually never had surgery um, to repair the fractures. It was a pretty incredible result. We did, I should say that we also did do shockwave on this patient, um, but really the daily therapy for him was the PMF, which helped not just with bone healing, um, but also with pain management for him. And it was very easy to use. He went home with it and the owners used it at home. So um, regarding wound healing, we've already talked about the mechanism of action. So what's happening with this targeted PMF therapy is you're getting an enhancement of anti-inflammatory nitrous oxide signaling, which is reducing the pro-inflammatory cytokines and also modulating release of growth factors. And so if you see in the diagram here, really what we're doing is we're modulating um, tissue healing phases, whereby we're actually reducing the inflammatory stage and modulating so that we get an earlier rise of our macrophages and able to get into the proliferative and remodeling stage earlier uh, with these electromagnetic field interventions. So here's a really severe case of a guinea pig. You can hardly tell the species that it is, um, but what you see there um, is a little bit of an open mouth and then its nostrils are just being taken over by this severe colitis. Um, so this is a combination of both a fungal and a bacterial infection. It's really severe. I mean, this guinea pig guinea pig could barely breathe, um, let alone eat. Um, and so we initiated PMF therapy and you can see the sequence here um, where we start to get healing of the tissues. Um, and you can see how much better he looks here after several weeks of getting de daily PMF therapy. Um, these pictures are courtesy of Dr. Cindy Brown. Um, she is very particular about her devices. You can see she puts her name on the loops, um, but you can see our adorable patient here and how much better he is um, in his nasal structures now that he can breathe with the, that infection under control 
and uh, reduction of the inflammation of all of those tissues. And then here you can see him today. He looks like a completely normal guinea pig doing fantastic with complete healing of this very, very severe wound. Um, here's a picture of it again, uh, how it originally presented. And here's another case actually that just um, came into the clinic um, last week. Um, this is a poor um, pig that was attacked by not just like a random dog, it's unfortunately a dog that lives in the household um, with her. Um, and so this is a Belgian Malinois that attacked her neck and she had severe multiple puncture wounds to her neck. It was in a lot of pain. Um, and so we started the PMF therapy. What's really lovely about it is we could just lose it. She was just had just the right size head where we could put it over her head. Um, and we started the therapy in hospital and then went home with the device didn't require any surgery. Um, and then here she is. Um, this was just a couple of days ago. And I'll show you this video and you can just see the difference in her demeanor from when she presented. Um, and now she um, is, you know, really interactive. She's eating great. Um, and you'll see her uh, wagging her tail there and just smiling at us. And she's, she's just feeling great. Um, and this was a really easy treatment for the owners to continue at home um, by just, again, placing that device over her head. All right, so I think now I've convinced you that the device is pretty effective in treating some of our exotic species, um, but I wanna make sure that you understand the difference in the PMMF devices that are out on the market. Um, so one thing that is common among all of the devices that are out there is they should all be FDA cleared. Um, the FDA clearance is for a particular wave, which is 27.12 megahertz. Uh, but it's not just about that megahertz wave. Um, the devices vary quite a bit in the waveform pulse width as well as the pulse frequency, in addition to the size and the geometry of the antenna, as well as the duration of the treatment itself. So for example, the Assisi loop, the standard one, you press the button and it will turn on for 15 minutes and then will automatically shut off. Whereas there's other devices where you put them on and the instructions are to leave them on for like 12 hours at a time. So you think like, oh, wow, it's just gonna work better if I you know, do it longer. Well, it really depends on the device and you really want to explore that device's research and what evidence they have to show efficacy. So here's just one example comparing targeted PMF, uh, which this was the CC loop. This was actually the, the human uh, version of it, which was through the IVV company. But these were human patients suffering from knee osteoarthritis. So the waveform here is 27.1 megahertz. Again, this is gonna be standard across all devices if they're FDA approved. But then we have a two millisecond pulse width and a two hertz pulse frequency compared to the non-targeted device, which has the same 27.1 megahertz, but now we have a hundred microsecond pulse, I'm sorry, um, um, uh, yeah, 100 microsecond pulse width and a thousand hertz pulse frequency. And this was prescribed for 12 hours daily compared to the Assisi loops treatment of just 15 minutes twice daily. So you'd think like, wow, okay, this is you know delivering a therapy for 12 hours a day. You'd think that potentially that could be more efficacious. But if you, if you look at the two microsecond uh, pulse width, it's basically delivering shorter. It's giving more frequent little pulses at a much lower energy level actually. So it's only two Hertz as compared to 1000 Hertz. And we know, um, and for my own training and acupuncture that the lower the Hertz, the more opioid release you have. Um, but in any case, so in this study, uh, what they demonstrated was that um, despite the, the higher frequency and higher duration, the vast pain scores were only reduced by 25% in these patients with knee OA compared to the treatment that was only 15 minutes twice a day, we had a 38% reduction in the pain scores. So much more efficacious with the waveform frequency um, and the pulse width delivered by the CC loop. 
And all of the cases that we're going to be talking about today uh, are with the ACC loop and the waveform that I just discussed. Um, so let me introduce you to Dr. Latoya Lotney. She is awesome. And she also provided me with lots of pictures of the patients that we've treated over the last um, year together. This is a bearded dragon that was recovering postoperatively from an ovario hysterectomy. Um, and in our uh, hospital at AMC, we routinely use PMF to help patients in their postoperative recovery, um, and she did great. Um, and here's a patient that actually didn't do so well. So this, um, this sweet Conier's name is Bird. Um, and Bird actually So it had basically a pretty radical resection, went into cardiopulmonary arrest three times in the OR um, and required a tracheal plug. Um, hi, can you guys still hear me? Okay. Yeah, Dr. Alvarez, we can hear you, but I'm, I'm not sure. It doesn't look like your slide advanced. I'm, we're, I'm still looking at the difference in PEMF devices. Oh. Can you see it now? No. Oh, that's so interesting. Oh, let, me, uh, let me just reshare. Okay. I'm glad I stopped to ask if you could hear me because <laughs> it just <laughs> said, said there was um, like there was a connection issue. So let me just reshare and uh, hopefully that will. There we go. Can you see it? Hello? Yeah. Do we see a bearded dragon? Is that what we're yep. supposed to be seeing? Bearded yep, dragon. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Because the one before that. Yeah, was about the devices and you saw that. Perfect, yeah. Yeah, so this is Dr. Latoya Latney, um, awesome uh, exotics vet at AMC. Um, and this is a bearded dragon that was recovering post-op um, ovario hysterectomy and did fantastic. Um, and this little uh, poor bird is the one that had the squamous cell carcinoma resected, went into cardiopulmonary arrest three times um, and required a tracheal, developed a tracheal plug um, required an intraosseous catheter. So it had a lot of tracheal edema and a really, really rough recovery. And so we had the PMF basically continuously on this bird, um, which really um, seemed to make a tremendous difference in his recovery. Um, and here's another patient recovering postoperatively. Um, this is Choby. Choby had a facial abscess that was resected from his jaw, was in a lot of pain. I mean, you can just see how miserable he was on recovery here. And so it was really wonderful to have a non-pharmaceutical non -pharmaceutical means of providing pain management, and in particular, a reduction of soft tissue pain and edema. Um, this is a chinchilla that had uh, impacted um, premolar, um, had extensive extractions, and was also having a really rough recovery. Um, at AMC, we really, really like using the PMF, particularly for patients that are having uh, oral issues. Um, so for the rabbits that are having um, dental impactions, that are having tooth root abscesses, you know, all of this type of severe oral pain. I mean, these are herbivores and they really need to be fed on a continual basis. So any type of oral pain is, is really going to have a huge impact on their quality of life. Um, so we love using the PMF, um, especially for oral pain or patients recovering from oral surgery. Um, this is another rabbit that's recovering post-dental, and you can see she's already eating and doing fantastic and getting her PMF therapy um, while she's eating and recovering. Um, and you can see how well she tolerates it there. Um, here's another patient. Um, we have lots of these um, small mammal patients that do really well um, post um, dental surgery and extractions. Um, and the other one that's a little bit odd, and I, I unfortunately don't have a picture of one actually getting treatment, but we do use it also, um, interestingly, for some anxiety disorders like feather picking. We're not using the calmer canine, but I'm curious to maybe try that signal for them. Um, but they do seem to respond to the ACC loop signal. Um, and perhaps it is just from reducing the inflammation as opposed to targeting their anxiety. But we are having some success with feather picking as well. Um, and the other major category that we use pretty frequently is for patients with GI stasis, uh, or if they've had any kind of intestinal surgery uh, to help the healing of those tissues um, and the pain that's associated. We know that with GI stasis, um, there is a lot of pain associated. And again, anything we can do to get these patients eating uh, faster um, is really 
excellent because these guys are, again, can be difficult to medicate. Um, and this was a really fun case that we also treated recently. Um, let me, um, his name is Spanky. Um, so he suffered from a stroke. Um, and this is actually him after treatment. He was not eating before. And I'm um, sorry, I'll turn off my talking through there, but he um, ate right afterwards. Let me show you um, the picture of him here on initial presentation where he, um, sorry, this guy's blocked a little bit, but you can see the picture there behind. Um, he couldn't even stand. Um, Spanky was really severely affected um, by the stroke. Um, she was basically non-ambulatory, um, was not eating at all. Um, and, you know, PMF was a major component of her treatment. Um, and she just perked up right away um, after we did her treatment. And that's when I took this lovely video when you can see her sitting up now and eating. And it was really a pleasure. And we've actually treated two um, stroke patients just in the past two weeks. Um, and so again, think about that blood flow that goes into the area leads to vasodilation, angiogenesis, and really, really good to bring that blood flow into the brain. The other major category, and it's really what we have a lot of evidence for um, and what I contributed to you in uh, scientific research is the effects of the ACC loop on reducing pain. Um, so these are early studies, or I shouldn't even say early studies, but these are some of the major human studies um, using this same signal. Um, this is primarily in patients recovering from breast reconstruction after mammary carcinoma. And we're seeing really drastic reductions in vast pain scores, as well as reduction of inflammatory cytokines. We had talked about that early on with the uh, constitutive nitrous oxide signaling where we get a reduction of interleukin-1 beta, that inflammatory cytokine. And they demonstrated that that was reduced by 40% the, at the site of the wound in these recovering women. And then also very interestingly, um, after surgery, they had a reduction in narcotic use by as much as 50%. And it was, it was a really interesting finding because in my study that I did on this device, I had a similar finding where we had a really drastic reduction um, in use of pain medications after the patients went home post-operatively. Um, and this brings me to another really important topic, at an important topic as we're talking about reptiles, which is that um, for those of you who are treating reptiles, um, which NSAID is the most effective for treating pain in reptiles? Is it a COX-1 inhibitor um, such as aspirin? I mean, aspirin inhibits both COX-1 and 2, but it's actually more COX-1 selective. Uh, or would it be a COX-2 selective inhibitor like meloxicam? Or is it um, something like Zubrin that inhibits both COX-1 and COX-2? Or do we just have no idea what type of NSAID is better for reptiles? So here's another poll. Um, so if you don't mind pulling that up, it should be ready there as well. Uh, so let's see, is there, let me see if I can find the next question. <laughs> let me end this polling. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Perfect. Yeah, no worries. So, um, so you guys go ahead and plug in your answer there. Which NSAID do you think is most effective for reptiles? COX-1 inhibitor, COX-2, COX-1N2, or do we not know at all? I'll give you guys a couple of seconds there to plug in your answer. All right, awesome. All right, so the majority of you um, said that it's unknown. We don't know which is most effective. Um, and then the rest of you are mostly using COX-2 inhibitors. Um, so it's a little bit of a trick question um, because it really depends on the species, but really most of you are correct in that we are um, really talking about, sorry, I'm trying to, what is going on here? Oh, 
Okay. Um, which is that it really depends on the reptile. So I've just got a couple of papers here um, to demonstrate the information that we do know. So regarding pythons, we know that they express primarily COX-1 in inflamed tissues. This is a study that was published in AJVR 2015. Um, whereas in box turtles, there was a really nice study published um, out of Duncan LaSalle's group um, in the Journal of Zoo Medicine in 2012, where in box turtles, they demonstrated that both COX-1 and COX-2 is upregulated in traumatized tissue, but yet again, in inflamed muscle tissue, it's actually primarily COX-1. So if we had to guess, probably most reptiles respond more to COX-1 inhibitors than COX-2 inhibitors, um, but this can even vary within organ systems in the reptiles and between species as well well. So the truth is we probably don't know enough about the efficacy of NSAIDs in reptiles. And if anything, they're probably more receptive to COX-1 inhibitors. And these studies actually also demonstrated toxicity in kidney and liver, much like we see in cats and dogs. Um, and so there is definitely potential for toxicity of these medications. Um, so really the bottom line here is that the traditional NSAIDs we're using in small animal medicine, which are usually COX-2 selected inhibitors are probably not as effective for pain management in reptiles as they are um, in dogs and cats. So what can we use instead? Well, um, we have been using PMF uh, with our reptile patients. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous uh, Burmese, Burmese python um, that presented with um, she was basically egg bound. She had 16 eggs in her. This is a nine foot python. She had to go to surgery and had three feet of her salomic, um, of her coelom removed. Um, so it's a quite, quite a large area of her gut that had to be removed. Um, and the PMF was used to help her in her recovery. And she actually did great. Um, we've been using PMF actually for egg bound birds as well, but this we really used to help heal her salomic incision. Um, and she did really well. Um, so again, really, pain management in reptiles is really, really challenging, mostly because we don't know what is effective and safe for them. Um, and this is something that we know um, is non-invasive and can really be a, a wonderful additional tool in your pain management for those patients. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the study that I conducted, just to give you a little bit of breadth of our understanding of this particular device in, um, in dogs, which I hope does carry through to our exotic species. So I conducted a prospective double-blind randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial at the Animal Medical Center. Um, we enrolled 60 patients, 53 of which completed the study. Um, and we randomized this. So 27 dogs received the targeted um, PMF treatment with the ACC loop and the other 28 had a sham control treatment. So the device looked exactly the same, um, but did not deliver any of the PMF therapy. And our aim was really to evaluate um, differences in post-operative pain, wound healing, uh, functional outcome in the dogs uh, recovering from hemilaminectomy. Um, and this was published in JAHA 2019. Um, and the device, just so that you know what, what it delivers, um, it delivers what we talked about, that 27.12 megahertz, which is FDA approved with a two microsecond pulse duration at two hertz pulse frequency um, with a peak magnetic field of four um, micro Tesla. And we used to think actually that it was only a... a a field that was about two thirds the diameter of the opening, but we now understand is actually much broader than that. So it's gonna go on either end of the opening of the CC loop to approximately 20 centimeters on either side. Um, it does, the field does taper off as you get further away from the target, um, but it will penetrate through um, hard and soft tissue. So for example, it'll penetrate through bone, um, muscle, and also if you have blankets or bandage material, um, it, will, it will go through all of that. Um, the signal can be interfered by metal, um, but it's not that it's contraindicated. It just won't get through metal as well as it will soft tissues or blankets. Um, so that is what I used in the study. And that is the delivery that we would be providing for our exotic patients as well. Um, so in my study, what we demonstrated was that we had significantly improved wound 
wound scores six weeks uh, postoperatively. Uh, we did not find statistical differences in pain scores that were assigned by either the veterinarians or the owners. Uh, also no difference in the neurologic scores or unfortunately the ability to regain functional tasks such as urinating voluntarily standing or walking. Um, however, the device was found by all owners. They reported that it was very easy to administer with no side effects noted. And most importantly, um, the finding that was really interesting is that owners that were using the PMF device compared to the sham placebo control administered almost twice more codeine to the patients with the placebo as compared to um, the treatment device. Um, so we were able to essentially lower the amount of pain medication that was administered for the patients that received the PMF device. So that's the big takeaway from our study is that it did seem to have an impactful difference in improving pain management for our patients. Um, so going now to leave you, I wanna leave you with some really practical advice. And these are just treatment recommendations. We don't necessarily have studies to tell you definitively that these are the best protocols, but this is what I recommend uh, for your exotic species. So for post-op patients um, in the acute phases post-operatively, of course, we're dealing with an inflammatory phase. Um, is of course you wanna place the loop directly over the surgical site. So the closer you are to the lesion, the better. Um, and then ideally, um, you can get the, um, a CC does have a device that is meant for post-operative healing that will actually cycle through every two hours. Um, so you can administer that treatment every two hours for the first 48 hours and then taper off for the remaining um, post -op, initial post-operative recovery of 10 to 14 days by administering the treatment QID. And then for your chronic inflammatory state, so let's say they had surgery, but they're having complications and now we're really in a chronic inflammatory state. For those guys, I recommend treating them QID for 10 days until the signs improve. And then you can taper off, say to like one or two treatments daily. And I'm, I'm happy to share these, um, these protocols with you. Um, and then for rhinitis, post-dentals, oral pain, you know, we talked about how responsive our patients have been for these conditions. Uh, we place the loop over the head, almost like a necklace, and then we're treating them QID for two days or until the pain improves or the patient is eating well. Uh, for gastric stasis and inflammation, so this would be primarily your rabbits and other small mammals, you place the loop over the entire caudal abdominal region. So you basically loop their entire body um, into the loop, um, and then you administer a QID until clinical signs resolve or they're eating well, um, and then reduce it to BID for three to five days. Uh, and then for mild cases, you can treat them BID for two days or until the signs resolve. So it's not a bad idea if you have, let's say, a rabbit that has had episodes of gastric stasis that you just dispense one of these ACC loops and the owner can just keep it at home. And if they see recurrence of sign, they can just go ahead and be proactive and initiate treatment. Um, and so in summary, um, we want to use PMF and we have evidence for um, increasing wound and bone healing also for decreasing soft tissue swelling, edema, and inflammation, improving pain management, particularly in the home setting, um, as well as an opportunity to treat pain non-pharmacologically. Um, and the last thing I wanted to leave you with um, is just contraindications. There's very few, but if you have any patients that have a pacemaker, which I don't think many of our exotic species do, um, but anything that um, has an electrical signal to it, like um, a diabetic um, monitoring system that's implanted, uh, a pacemaker, if they have severe arrhythmia, some of the macaws in particular can suffer from arrhythmias. Um, so anything that is very sensitive to an electrical signal would be a potential contraindication. Or if the owner has a pacemaker, you would, it's not that they can't administer it, but they wouldn't want to be near the signal because it could affect the function of their pacemaker. But other than that, there really are no contraindications. So really very safe modality. And with that, I wanted to thank um, both Dr. Latoya Latney and Dr. Cindy Brown, who provided a lot of the pictures for tonight's presentation. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me and my team at rehab.team at amcny.org. And a big, big thank you to Assisi Animal Health for hosting this lecture. It was really fun for me to put this together. Um, and I would like to leave the remaining minutes for any questions from the audience.
All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Alvarez. Uh, we do have some questions coming through. We'll give everyone uh, a few moments to post some additional questions. I do want to mention that as a thank you for everyone who attended this evening and you're very interested in the CC Loop, uh, we are running a special. You can enjoy an additional 15% off of those prices on our website with the coupon code CEISFUN at checkout. And with that, we'll get right into the questions. Um, question number one, let's see, is PEMF replacing laser therapy or is it an adjunct treatment? That's a great question. I would say it's an adjunct treatment because these work very differently. So your laser or photobiomodulation is having uh, an impact really on um, the ATP production in your cells. So the, the main mode of action of laser is to improve ATP production. Whereas with your PMF device, you're having an anti-inflammatory cascade with that increased production of constitutive nitrous oxide synthase. So two very different mechanisms of, of action. Um, so I would not say that laser is the same as PMF. They're two very different modalities and you could certainly use both of them on a patient. Okay, uh, next question. Did you say that you used the loop nonstop on the little bird tracheal inflammation? Yeah, initially, I wouldn't say nonstop, but it was very frequent, like approximately every two hours. Okay, and which loop do you use for rabbits with gut stasis? It's the ACC loop. Okay, yeah. Right. Is it the 10 centimeter or the 20 centimeter? Oh, so... I typically use the 20 centimeter. Um, it depends on the size um, that you have. You know, I do recommend the more targeted the therapy, the better. So you can use the 10 centimeter loop if your patient fits in it. For, for gastric stasis, I'd really like to put the entire patient in the loop. So if they're small enough for the 10 centimeter, that's perfect and you can do that. Um, but otherwise you can use the 20 centimeter. All right. Dr. Alvarez, I actually have a question of my own. We also have the, the loop lounges. Do you use that for any of your bunnies or guinea pigs or other pocket pets? So we have the lounge up in our rehab department, but when I treat exotic patients, I come down to exotics. <laughs> um, and I don't know that they've used the lounge. I love it for my patients. When we're working with them, we just have them sit on the lounge and it certainly seems to relax them. Um, and maybe, maybe it's just like my old nature because I've been using the targeted device for so long that I really like to target the, the, the therapy to the area that's affected. So in my mind, the more targeted the treatment, the more efficacious it's going to be. So I'm going to use a lounge more for relaxation for patients that are anxious if they're stressed. So I would recommend it, you know, if you have a spe species that's hospitalized and seems very stressed, I think using the lounge would be really lovely. Um, but if you have a particular lesion, let's say you have a non-healing wound, um, I would probably still go for the, the loop. Okay. Do you have a question? Uh, how do you keep the birds from biting the loop? if that's an issue. <laughs> um, we haven't really had an issue with them. Interestingly, I've had dogs eat the loop. Um, maybe it's because they're so sick. <laughs> A lot of, as I said, you know, the biggest challenge is these, these species present to us late in, in their stage of disease. Um, but um, what we can do for the birds that are improving and getting more active um, is just do it under supervision or you can put an e-collar on them. All right. Uh, let's see. We just had a couple of comments. I've got one person that they offer it to their patients, but it's usually cost prohibitive. Uh, unless it's a large rabbit or iguana, they have owners put the pet in its own small carrier and the 20 centimeter loop suffices. So yes, that, that is definitely another option as well. Yeah. Um, let's see. There's other questions coming through. Uh, a lot of just really, just great comments on the presentation. Amazing. So yes, everyone's very thrilled so far. We love it. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> All right. We'll give everyone a few more minutes um, to post their questions. We... There's another comment from Dr. Brown that she says that she puts the birds in a carrier in their cage with the loop underneath a towel where they can't see it. So that can help address that bird biting at the loop. Yeah, that is, that is a great, and we do that with a lot of them too. Um, 
you know, just put it underneath because it does go through bedding. And so, because a lot of these um, species are so small, um, if you have the 20 centimeter loop, it's almost a little bit like the lounge because if there's, you know, they're sitting in their cage, you can put it underneath and it will, you know, the signal is, is, is large enough that it will penetrate through. Great. But thank you for that comment, Dr. Brown, because that's, that's a great tip. All right, let's see. Uh, for birds, if the pet can perch, the loop goes under the perch. If it can't perch, we place it under a towel. Another great idea. There you go. All right, that's great, great questions. Uh, let's see, if there's any others that might come through, we'll give it just a few more minutes. We have a couple of questions about cost. Um, if you send an email into info at a cCanimalhealth.com, we can provide the pricing for you, whether you're a veterinarian or sometimes pet owners make it onto this broadcast so we can answer correctly for each of you. All right. I love all these questions. Thank you guys. Let's see, we use, does the metal door or a plastic crate interfere with the loop? So only if, so they can be in a metal crate, but what you'd want to do is the loop be directly on your patient. In that case, it has no interference at all. It's really more of an issue if you have a metal implant inside the patient, and then it's just not going to penetrate through that metal as well as the soft tissues, but it's not really an issue. It's not that the metal cage is going to interfere with the signal going into the patient, but it's not going to go further. So in other words, the patient's right next to the cage. It's not going to, it's going to bounce off of that. And it's not, it's not going to have an effect. Whereas if, if it was covered in a towel, it's, it's, it's not going to interfere with the signal. So some people will actually try to cover metal cages with towels so that there's less interference. But I, honestly, I don't really worry too much about it because if you're putting the if you're putting the device directly on your patient, you're getting that penetration. So it really shouldn't be an issue. Okay. And let's see, is it effective on arthritis? Oh, definitely. Um, we use it a lot in our older patients um, for canine and felines and particularly for your macaws and your older birds that get OA as well as your rabbits and rats. Um, it can be a, a wonderful, again, adjunctive um, pain management treatment. Uh, next question, could I use the loop on a TPLO patient as well? Yes, in fact, we do it. Um, I just had a post-op TPLO today. It's a standard uh, treatment. So for all of our patients at AMC that have TPLOs, um, we work on them as they come out of the um, out of anesthesia as they're recovering. And part of our post-operative treatment is PMF. Um, so we don't, this is what I was saying is they have an implant. And so you're not gonna get as good penetration through that plate, um, but the stifle itself, of course, which has no plate in it, it's gonna get the therapy. So, so it's not that it's not gonna work or that it's contraindicated. It's just not gonna penetrate through the plate. So in other words, may not be as effective for healing that osteotomy site because the plate is gonna interfere with that, but should help for example, Example, in reducing synovitis um, and that, you know, all of the inflammatory changes that are taking place within the stifle itself. Okay. We have one final question with respect to everybody's time this evening. Uh, does it improve OA or only help treat the pain? Only help treat the pain as far as I know. <laughs> we don't have any studies to show that it modulates um, reduction and progression of the arthritis, but we do know that with OA, because it is such an inflammatory cascade, um, you know, if we're able to modulate the inflammation, you know, maybe there is decrease in the progression, but I, I personally think of it more as a pain management treatment, as opposed to reversing or slowing down the disease itself. And, and at least we don't have any studies to demonstrate that it slows the disease. But, you know, in, in these OA patients, the way that I think of it is you really need to treat them in a multimodal approach. And I think the loop is, is a wonderful tool among the many other things you should be doing to manage their OA. Well, Dr. Alvarez, we want to thank you so much for your time this evening and everybody at home who took time out to join us as well. We hope to see you on another SCC Animal Health lecture in the future. And with that, I'm gonna wish everyone a great evening wherever you are.